that. In this case, can you tell us a little bit more about why the general contractor faced exposure? Absolutely. Happy to talk about that. So as Hank pointed out, this was a scenario where we have an owner, has a general contractor, general contractor hired a sub, that sub had a subcontractor, that subcontractor hired the crane with an operator. And in this particular scenario, um, you know, the contract language works exactly as we would expect. The contract between the owner and the GC, GC's down to the subs, uh, was good language and appropriate language. The GC in this circumstance faced exposure for a few reasons beyond those contracts. One was the risk transfer did actually stop at the crane. So as we mentioned before, it typically favors the crane company and in this circumstance, it certainly did. And the entity that actually hired them had um, minimal limits. And you know I don't remember offhand exactly what they were, but their limits barely paid for the damage to the crane themselves. So right there, that first up subcontractor didn't have adequate limits. Uh, on the next layer of subcontracting, that entity also didn't have limits. So now you see where this is heading with who has money available to pay for the crane. And the third issue, and probably the most important is, in this particular circumstance, the plaintiffs and the claimants, they took the necessary steps to try to place some liability on the general contractor. So let me just touch upon that last issue quickly. In this particular issue, the contract documents and even the health and safety plan that general contractor stated affirmatively that they would be involved in crane operations, including weather-related risks, which is what led to this incident. And on that particular day, the general contractor was not even on site. And that contradicted exactly with what their own documents said they would do.